Hi everybody, this is Hunter the Honda Mackinan, and welcome to yet again to the Honda and Kaiser's YouTube podcast. <laughs> yes, and that's Kaiser. So, uh, this is our, what is this, this is our fourth podcast, isn't it? Yes. No, not the fourth, fifth, sorry. This is our fifth podcast, and uh, in case you are, if, if for whatever reason you have not listened to the previous podcasts, how dare you? Uh, but also, <laughs> so what do we do on the podcast? Well, on the podcast, I read an Edgar Allan Poe story, and Kaiser, who's that, who, who's the person you can hear in uh, giggling in the background, uh, will either make funny jokes or unfunny jokes, and also sound effects. All right, this is how we normally and, do it. And the and the audience, they, the audience job is to listen to five minutes of this and go, never more. <laughs> exactly. That was, a, that was a bad joke. <laughs> yeah, I love doing this. They're, they're not. They're I, you know we get decent for my channel. We get decent views for these. Not like anything huge. They're not like the He Man videos. But I like doing these. I just love uh, the Edgar Allan Poe stuff. Okay, so last time we did things a little bit differently, and we had Kaiser actually read the story while I was making the sound effects. Yep, that's but, definitely something that will ever more. <laughs> No, I think we can do. I think you can do one more, but I, I need to pick you pick a shorter story for you next time. Uh, <laughs> and definitely, and definitely not a story of a guy going. I ejaculated. <laughs> okay. Although we, we did, we did get a homegrown meme of innuendo out of it, so it wasn't innuendo. all bad. Innuendo. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So today we wanted to uh, do. Um, uh, we wanted to do this, uh, the, the story I wanted, wanted us to do, and we will eventually do it, it, was the gold bug, because that's kind of an important one that I want to do. Uh, but we're recording this directly after Sunday Night Kaiser, and because the gold bug is quite a long story, I decided, okay, maybe not. Do, maybe let's not do that. And instead, we're going to do just another short one. This one is called Hop Frog. It was published in 1845. Brilliant. And... Um, yeah, this has some very tradition. This is a bit more traditional uh, Edgar Allan Poe story, slightly on the crazy side, if you will. I, I think you're gonna like this, Kaiser. This is this is uh, this is one of the screwier, uh, still dark, but kind of a screwier Edgar Allan Poe story. And it was one of the very final ones uh, that he published. Uh, while, while I was about it, to say he, he probably would have been um, drunk as hell at this point, right? I don't know about drunk, but yeah, this was, uh, well, the way we usually do this is that at the end we reserve a little bit of time for discussion, because I don't want to give, I don't want to overbore, uh, well, I don't want to drag out the introduction, so let's not drag out the introduction, let's finally move on to the story, which is Hopfrog. All right, here we go. I never knew anyone so keenly alive to a joke as the king was. He seemed to live only for joking to tell a good story of the joke kind. <laughs> <laughs> and to tell it well was the surest road to his favor. Thus, it happened that his seven ministers were all noted for their accomplishments. Hello, 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 and the rest. As jokers. <laughs> <laughs> they all took after the king, too, in being large, corpulent, oily men, as well as... <clears throat> hey, hey. As well as inimitable jokers. Whether people grow fat by joking or whether there is something in fat itself which predisposes to a joke, I have never been quite able to determine, but certain it is that a lean joker is a rara avis in terrace. There's a little bit more Latin in there. Uh, sorry, don't know what that quite means. All right. About the refinements, or, as he called them, the ghost of wit, the king troubled himself very little. But I'm Tish. <laughs> the ghost troubled him. Sorry, not the ghost. The king troubled himself very little. He had an especial admiration for the breath in a jest, and would often put up with the length for the sake of it. Over niceties wearied him. He would have preferred... Rabelais' Gargantua to the Zadig of Voltaire, and, upon the whole, practical jokes suited his taste far better than verbal ones. <laughs> was that a whoopee cushion? Yeah, that was a whoopee cushion. <laughs> okay, that was a tiny whoopee cushion. You can do better than that. 
Uh, do you really want to challenge me on that, though? All right, let's go. Let, let's keep going. At the date of my narrative, professing jesters had not altogether gone out of fashion at court. Several of the great continental powers still retained their fools, who were <sighs> uh, who wore motley with caps and bells, and who were expected to be. Call him Doctor Feelgood. He's the one to make you feel all right. Not that kind of motley. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right, that was a stretch. And who were expected to be always ready with sharp witticisms at the moment's notice in consideration of the crumbs that fell from the royal table. Our king, as a matter of course, retained his fool. The fact is, he required something in a way of folly, if only to counterbalance the heavy wisdom of the seven wise men who were his ministers, not to mention himself. That's a very <laughs> subtle fat burn. <laughs> <laughs> All right. His fool, or professional jester, was not only a fool, however. His value was trebled in the eyes of the king by the fact that his being also a dwarf and a cripple. Dwarves were as common at court in those days as fools, and many monarchs would have found it difficult to get through the, their days, days are rather longer at court than elsewhere, without both a jester to laugh with and a dwarf to laugh at. But as I have... Okay. Have all... <laughs> yes? I gotta, I gotta do the joke now. Hi ho! <laughs> hi ho! Hi ho! Hi ho! I ho do ho do do. Okay, but as I have already observed, our jesters, in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, are fat, round, and unwieldy. So that it so that it was no small source of self-gratulation with our king that in Hopfrog, this was the fool's name, he possessed a triplicate treasure of in one person. I believe the name Hopfrog was not that given to the dwarf by his sponsors at baptism, but it was conferred upon him by general consent of the several ministers on account of his inability to walk as other men do. In fact, Hopfrog would only get along by a sort of in interjectional gait, something between a leap and a wriggle. A mo Boing. <laughs> exactly. A movement that afforded illimitable amusement and, of course, consolation to the king, for, notwithstanding the protuberance of his stomach and a constitutional swelling of the head, the king, by his whole court, was accounted a capital figure. He was huge! Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. The, the, the picture I've got in my head at the moment with the dwarf jester is all I'm picturing right now is just Elmer Fudd. <laughs> what was it? Elmer Fudd from the uh what what was it that happened in the Sonic Let's Play? Uh <laughs> Elmer Fudd from Ghostbusters or something like that. That's what Derupka said it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Moving on. But although Hop Frog No, it was uh Elmer Fudd from Altered Beast, that's it. <laughs> right from your grave. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but although Hop Frog, through the distortion of his legs, could move only with great pain and difficulty along a road or floor, <laughs> the prodigious muscular power which nature seemed to have bestowed upon his arms by way of compensation for deficiency in the lower limbs enabled him to perform many feats of wonderful dexterity where trees or ropes were in question or anything... <laughs> or anything else to climb. At such exercises, he certainly much more resembled a squirrel or a small monkey than a frog. <laughs> Lovely squirrel noises. <laughs> God damn it. I, I, I listened to that friggin', uh, what was it, Angels with Scaly Wings? Now on Twitch and YouTube. <laughs> that you did the reading of, and I, was, I started to get really uncomfortable with your breathy voice towards the end. <laughs> I, I mean, seriously, I, I, 
I honestly felt, I honestly, I was honestly feeling a little violated, just saying. <laughs> you know, there was a reason why that's because I strained my voice toward, um, all the, oh yeah! Oh yeah, exactly, <laughs> and when I told you to switch to Kermit, you still kept doing the, oh yeah! <laughs> Even though it wasn't in the text at all. So if you wanna, so if you wanna hear Kaiser read, you can actually go do that on his channel. He's got a bunch of stuff he's read, uh, like visual novels and stuff. Mm. All okay. right. Yes. Were you saying something? Uh, I, was, I was just agreeing with you. Okay. Yes. Moving on. I'm not able to say with the <clears throat> sorry with precision uh, from what country Hopfrog originally came. It was from some barbarous region. However, that no person. France. <laughs> However, that no person ever heard of. <laughs> Stale France, a vast distance from the court of our king. Probably Luxembourg, I would guess. Okay. <laughs> Do you even know where Luxembourg is? Uh, yeah, it's in Luxembourg. <laughs> or, Le yeah. or Liechtenstein, that's another good one. Okay. St stuck in the crack between <laughs> Austria and Switzerland. <laughs> okay, Innuendo. moving on. Innuendo. Innuendo. A vast distance from our court of... Oh, sorry, I read that part. A uh, hopfrog and a young girl, very little less dwarvish than himself, although of exquisite proportions and a marvelous dancer. <laughs> uh, oh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. Had been forcibly that carried was. off from their respective homes in adjoining provinces, and sent as presents to the king by one of his ever-victorious generals. Under these... March, March. Yes. Under these circumstances, it is not to be wondered that uh, a close intimacy arose between the two little captives. Indeed, they soon became sworn friends. Hopfrog, who, although he made a great deal of sport, was by no means popular, had it not in his power to render Trepetta many services. But she, on account of her grace and exquisite beauty, although a dwarf, was universally admired and petted, so she possessed much influence and never failed to use it whenever she could for the benefit of Hopfrog. On some grand state occasion, I forget what, uh, the king determined to have a masquerade, and whenever a masquerade, or any Thing, uh, of that kind occurred at a, our court, then the talent, both uh, both of Hopfrog and Trippetta, Trippetta is the female dwarf, uh, mm -hmm. were sure to be called into play. Hopfrog, in especial, was so inventive in the way of getting up page pageants, suggesting novel characters, and arranging costumes for masked balls, uh, that nothing could be done. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> it seems without his assistance. By the way, what the hell is up with that word ball? Like, I know having a ball, like, that's a that's an old saying. It's just an old word for party, but yeah. Oh boy, I'm having a ball, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it makes sense from... If I mean, it only makes sense in, like, the 70s if you're dancing, having a ball, because the big giant disco ball, but they didn't have those back then. How would you? How would you know? <laughs> I'm just imagining in the early 1800s and with like a, you know, you know, like an Irish band with their violins and fiddles and you know drums made out of like buckets and then a freaking disco ball, <laughs> like a barnyard disco. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on. Uh -huh. Wait, where am I? I lost my place. There it is. Uh, the night appointed for the feat had arrived. A gorgeous hall had been fitted up under Trepetta's eye with every kind of device which could possibly give eclat uh, to a masquerade. The whole court was in a fever of expectation. As for costumes and characters, it might well be supposed that everybody had come to a decision on such points. Many had made up their minds as to what roles they should assume a week or even a month in advance, and in fact there was not a particle of indecision anywhere, except in the case of the king and his seven ministers. Why they hesitated, why they hesitated, I never could tell. Unless they, <clears throat> unless they, I don't know what happened there, unless they did it by a way of joke. More probably they found it difficult on account of being so fat <laughs> to make up their minds. <laughs> 
<laughs> are you are you getting the sense that there's a kind of a running theme here? <laughs> At all events, time flew, and as the last resort, they sent for Trippetta and Hopfrog. <clears throat> when the two little friends obeyed the summons of the king, they found him sitting at his wine with the seven members of his cabinet council. <coughs> but the monarch appeared to be in a very ill humor. He knew that Hopfrog was not fond of wine, for it excited the poor cripple almost to madness, and madness is no comfortable feeling. But the king loved his practical jokes, and took pleasure in forcing Hopfrog to drink and, as the king called it, to be merry. Ho, ho, ho! Come here, Hopfrog, he said, said he, as the jester and his friend entered the room. Swallow this bumper to the he health of your absent friends. Here Hopfrog sighed, and then, and then let us have the benefit of your invention. We want characters, characters, man, something novel, out of the way. We are wearied with his everlasting sameness. Come, drink, the wine will brighten your wits. By the way, actually, you, 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 you were talking about how you, <laughs> how you didn't enjoy reading that previous Edgar Allan Poe story, but you actually did the character lines very well. Thank you. Yeah. I've, I've had practice at that. Yeah, you're I'm you're quite a, I'm yeah. quite a character myself. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're you're a much better character reader than like a narrator. Maybe we should do that. Hey, maybe we should do that sometime mm -hmm. that you read like the dialogue and I read the uh, narration. Okay, but let's move on. Hopfrog endeavored as usual to get up a jest in reply to these advances from the king, but the effort was too much. It happened to be the poor dwarf's birthday, and the command to drink to his absent friends forced the, forced the tears to his eyes. Many large, bitter drops fell into the goblet as he took it, humbly from the hand of the tyrant. Ah, ha, 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 roared the latter as the dwarf reluctantly drained the beaker. See what a glass of good wine can do. Why, your eyes are shining already. <laughs> poor fellow. <laughs> okay. Poor fellow, his large eyes gleamed, rather than shone, for the effect of the wine on his uh, excitable brain was not more powerful than instantaneous. He placed the goblet nervously on the table and looked round upon the company with a half-insane stare. They all seemed highly... Whoosh! <laughs> they all seemed highly amused at the success of the king's joke. Mm. <laughs> and uh, now, and now to business, said the prime minister, a very fat man. <laughs> yes, said the king. Come lend us your assistance. Characters, my fine fellow. We stand in need of characters, all of us. Ha 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 ha. And as this was seriously meant for a joke, his laugh was chorused by the seven. <laughs> Thank and me too. <laughs> Hopfrog, Hopfrog also laughed, although feebly and somewhat vacantly. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, Sans? <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, well, hey, well, they're pretty close, actually. The, I mean, the laughs. Okay. Come, come, said the king impatiently. Have you nothing to suggest? Uh, I am endeavoring to think of something novel, replied the dwarf, abstractedly, for he was quite bewildered by the wine, and also French, because you, because you said yep. France. The, okay. unknown, the unknown country known as France. Endeavoring, cried the tyrant fiercely. What do you mean by that? Ah, I perceive you are sulky and want more wine. Here, drink this. And he poured out another goblet full and offered it to the cripple, who merely gazed at it, gasping for breath. Drink, I say, <gasps> shouted, shouted the monster. Or oh, by the fiends! The dwarf hesitated. The king grew purple with rage. The courtiers smirked. Trippetta, pale as a corpse, advanced the monarch's seat, and falling on her knees before him, implored him to spare her friend. The tyrant regarded her for some moments, in evident wonder at her audacity. He seemed quite he seemed quite at a loss what to do or say, how most becomingly to express his indignation. At last, without uttering a syllable, he pushed her violently from him and threw the contents Ugh. and threw the contents of the brimming goblet in her face. The poor Smash. the poor girl got up uh, the best she could, and not daring even to sigh, resumed her position at the foot of the table. 
there were there was a dead silence for about half a minute during which the falling of a leaf or of a feather might have been heard that's the 1800s version of having of being of it being so quiet you can hear a pin drop mm -hmm. it was interrupted by a low but harsh and protracted uh, sorry it was interrupted by a low but harsh and protracted grating sound which seemed to come at once from every corner of the room you know that was actually pretty good <laughs> You maybe hammed it up a bit at the end. <laughs> okay, but that but that will be important. So remember that noise you made, ju just, that you just made with your mouth. Okay. What 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 are you making that noise for? Demanded the king, turning furiously to the dwarf. The latter seemed to have recovered in great measure from his intoxication, and looking fixedly but quietly into the tyrant's face, merely ejaculated, "I, I, I, how could I?" How could it have been me? The sound appeared to come from without, observed one of the courtiers. I fancy it was the parrot of the, of, at the window, wetting his bill upon his cage wires. True, re <laughs> True replied the monarch, as if, much, as if much relieved by the suggestion. But on the honor of a knight, I could have sworn that it was critting, critting of it. <clears throat> it was the critting of this vagabond's teeth. Hereupon the dwarf laughed. The king was too confirmed a joker to object to anyone's laughing, and displayed a set of large, powerful, and very repulsive teeth. Moreover, <laughs> moreover, he avowed his perfect willingness to swallow as much wine as, as desired. The monarch was pacified, and having drained another bumper with no with no very perceptible Ill, Ill effect, Hopfrog entered at once and with spirit into the plans of the masquerade. Boing. I cannot tell what was the association of idea, observed he very tranquilly and as if he had never tasted the wine in his life. But you just after but just after your majesty had stuck had struck the girl and thrown the wine in her face, just after your majesty had done this and while the parrot was making that odd noise outside the window, there came into there came into my mind a capital diversion. One of my own country frolics, often enacted among us at our masquerades, but here it will be new altogether. Unfortunately, however, it requires a company of eight persons and here we are, cried the king, laughing at his acute discovery of the coincidence. Eight to a fraction, and I, my, I and my seven ministers. Come, what is the diversion? We call it, replied the cripple, the eight-chained orangutans, and it really is excellent sport, if well enacted. We will oh, enact... Please don't, yes? please don't that be... Please don't let that mean for eight... eight century version of the human centipede <laughs> well let's keep on reading and we will discover what it means we will enact it remarked the king drawing himself up and lowering his eyelids the beauty of the game continued hopfrog lies in the fright it occasions among the women capital roared the chorus of chorus i'm <coughs> so, sorry roared the in chorus the monarch and his ministry i will keep I will equip you as orangutans," proceeded the dwarf. "Leave all that. Leave all that to me. The resemblance shall be so striking that the company of masqueraders will take you for real beasts, and of course they will be as much terrified and astonished. I seem to have lost my French accent, and I'm now kind of vaguely like Spanish Latin <laughs> in that area." I don't know about you, but this is starting to sound like some weird fucked up prequel to Birders in the Rue Morg. <laughs> well, because that was in France, actually. And I, that, was, that was the voice I was also doing for Dupin, but uh, this is... I, 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 I seem to have completely lost track of my like French accent. I'm now kind of r drifting into my creepy Peter Lorre voice uh, that I sometimes <laughs> do. Okay. Oh, this is exquisite, exclaimed the king. Hop frog, I will make a man of you. Ooh. <laughs> In your window. <laughs> exactly. Uh, wait, I have to... Um... Oh, okay. The chains are for the purpose of increasing the confusion by their jangling. 
you are supposed to have escaped en masse uh, from your keepers. Your majesty cannot conceive the effect produced at a masquerade by eight chained orangutans, imagined to be real ones by most of the company, and rushing in with savage cries among the crowd of delicate... Uh, sorry. Among the crowd of delicately and gorgeously habited men and women, the contrast is inimitable. It must be, said the king, and the council arose hurriedly, as it was growing late, to put in execution the scheme of Hopfrog. His mode of e equipping the party as orangutans was very simple, by, but effective enough for, this, for his purposes. The animals in question had, at the epoch of my story, very rarely been seen in any part of the civilized world, and as the imitations... Uh, made by the dwarf were sufficiently beast-like and more than sufficiently hideous, their truthfulness to nature was thus thought to be secured. The king and his ministers were first encased in a tight-fitting stockinette shirts and, dra and drawers. <laughs> they were then saturated with tar. At this stage of the process, uh, someone of the party suggested feathers, but the but the suggestion <laughs> but the suggestion was at once overruled by the dwarf, who soon convinced the eight by ocular demonstration that the hair of such of such a brute as the orangutan was much more efficiently uh, re <clears throat> represented by flax. A thick coating of the latter was accordingly plastered upon the coating of tar. A long chain was now procured. First, it was passed uh, about the waist of the king and tied, then about another of the party and also tied, then about all, then about all successively in the same manner. When this chaining arrangement was complete and the party stood as, par <clears throat> as far apart from each other as possible, they formed a circle, and to make all things appear natural, Hopfrog passed the residue of the chain in two diameters at right angles across the circle after the fashion adopted at at the present day by those who capture chimpanzees or other large apes in Borneo. A grand saloon in which the masquerade was to take place was a circular room, very lofty, and receiving the light of the sun only through the single window at top. At night, the season of which the apart apartment was especially designed, it was illuminated principally by a large chandelier, depending, depending by a chain from the center of the skylight, and lowered or elevated by means of a counterbalance as usual. But in order not to look unsightly, this latter passed outside uh, the cupola and over the roof. The arrangements of the room had been left to Trepetta's superintendents, but in some particulars it seemed that she had been guided by the calmer judgment of her friend the dwarf. At his suggestion, it was that on this occasion the chandelier was removed, its waxen, its waxen trippings, which in weather so warm it was uh, quite impossible to prevent, would have been seriously detrimental to the rich dresses uh, of the guests who, on account of the crowded state of the saloon, could not all be expected to keep from, from out of its center, that is to say, from under the chandelier. Additional sconces were set in various parts of the hall, out of the, out of the war and flambeau emitting sweet odor was placed in the right hand of each of the uh, caryatides that stood against the wall, some fifty or sixty altogether. I have no idea what a karyotide is, actually. So that's that's kind of a it's, weird word. It's, it's a it's a um it's a new bucket for when you want to carry the water. The karyotide. Uh, <laughs> well, we'll go with that then. <laughs> the eight orangutans, taking Hopfrog's advice, waited patiently until midnight when the room was thoroughly filled with masqueraders before making their appearance. No sooner had the clock ceased striking, however, then they rushed, or rather rolled in altogether, for the impediments of their <laughs> chains caused most of the party to fall, and all to stumble as they entered. Now I'm just picturing Donkey Kong with a rolling attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The excitement among the masqueraders was prodigious. The 
and filled the heart of the king with glee. As had been anticipated, there were not a few of the guests who supposed the ferocious-looking creatures to be beasts of some kind in reality, if not precisely orangutans. Many of the women swooned with affright. And had not the king taken the precaution to exclude all weapons from the saloon, his party might soon have exp expiated their frolic in their blood. <laughs> As it was, a general rush was made for the doors, but the king had ordered them to be locked immediately upon the entrance. And, <laughs> and, the dwarfs, and at the dwarf's suggestion, the key had been deposited with him. While the tumult... Yes. While the tumult was at its height, and each masquerader attentive only to his own safety, for in fact there was a much re there was mu much real danger from the pressure of the excited crowd, the chain by which the chandelier uh, ordinarily hung and which had been drawn up on its removal might have been might have been seen very gradually to descend until it hooked until <clears throat> until it until it's hooked extremity came within three feet of the floor and sorry i did not mean to <laughs> overemphasize the end on chandelier uh, a sh chandelier <laughs> that was me that was just sloppy reading <laughs> okay soon after this the king and his seven friends having reeled about the hall in all directions found themselves at length in its center and of course in immediate contact with the chain while they were thus situated, the dwarf, who had followed noiselessly at their heels, incited them to keep up the commotion, took hold of their chain at the intersection of the two portions which cross the circle diam diametrically and at right angles. Here, with the rapidity of thought, he inserted the hook from which the chandelier, chandelier, <laughs> yeah, I keep reading that kind of funny, had been wont to, wont to depend and in an instant, by some unseen agency, the chandelier chain was drawn so far upward as to take the hook out of reach, and as an inevitable consequence, to drag the orangutans together in close connection and face to face. <coughs> the masqueraders by this time had recovered in some measure from their alarm, and beginning to regard the whole matter as a well-contrived pleasantry, set up a loud shout Set up a <clears throat> sorry. Set up a loud shout of laughter and predic uh, laughter at the predicament of the apes. Yeah. Now go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Leave them to me! Now screamed Hopfrog, his shrill voice making itself easily heard through all the din. Leave them to me! I fancy I know them! If I can only get a good look at them, I can soon tell who they are! Here, scrambling over the heads of the crowd, he managed to get to the wall, when, seizing a flambeau from one of the caryatides, he <laughs> returned as he went to the center of the room, leaping with the agility of a monkey upon the king's head, and thence clambered a few feet up the chain holding down the torch to examine the group of orangutans and still screaming, I shall soon find out who they are! And now, while the whole assembly, the apes included, were convulsed with laughter, the jester suddenly uttered, sorry, the, the jester suddenly uttered a shrill whistle. When the chain flew vi- <coughs> When the chain flew violently up for about thirty feet, dragging with it the dismayed and struggling orangutans, and leaving them su suspended in mid-air between the skylight and the floor. Hopfrog, Hopfrog, clinging to the chain as it rose, still maintained his relative position in respect to the eight m maskers. And still, uh, as if nothing were, th were the matter, continued to thrust his torch down towards them, as though endeavoring to Ugh. discover who they were. <laughs> Another thrust there. <laughs> Okay, so thoroughly astonished was the whole company at this ascent that a dead silence of about a minute's duration ensued. It was broken by just such a low, harsh, grating sound ah! 
as had before attracted the attention of the king and his counselors, when the former threw the wine in the face of Trepetta. But, on the present occasion, there could be no question as to whence the sound issued. It came from the fang-like teeth of the dwarf, who ground them and gnashed them, sorry, gnashed them, as he foamed at the mouth and glared. <laughs> and glared with an expression of maniacal rage in the upturned countenances of the king and his seven companions. Aha! Said at, said at length the infuriated Chester. Aha! I begin to see who these people are now. Here, pretending to scrutinize the king more closely, he held the flambeau of the flaxen coat which enveloped him and which instantly burst into a sheet of vivid flame in less than half a minute. The whole eight orangutans were f blazing fiercely. <coughs> amid the shrieks, <laughs> amid the shrieks of the multitude who gazed at them from below, horror-stricken and without the power to render them the slightest assistance, at length the flame suddenly increased in virulence, forced forced the Chester to climb higher up the chain to be out of their reach, and as he made this movement, the crowd again sank. For a brief instant into silence, the dwarf seized his op opportunity and once more spoke. I now see distinctly, he said, what manner of people these maskers are. They are a great king and his seven privy counselors. A king who does not scoop scruple to strike a defenseless girl and his seven counselors who have bet him in the outrage. As for myself, I am simply Hopfrog the Jester. And this is my last jest. Owing, the high owing to the high combustibility of both the flax and the tar to which, which it adhered, the dwarf had scarcely made an end of his brief speech before the work of vengeance was complete. The eight corpses swung in from in their chain, a fetid, blackened, hideous, and indistinguishable mass. The cripple hurled his torch at them, clambered leisurely at the, to the ceiling, and disappeared through the skylight. It is supposed that Trepetta, stationed on the roof of the saloon, had been, a, had been the accomplice of her friend in his fiery revenge, and that, together, they effected their escape to their own country, for neither Aww, was seen again. Romantic. <laughs> romantic. The end, yes. <laughs> That's the end. <laughs> Okay. Well, a pretty straightforward story. Yeah. What, what did you think about that story? Well, that that makes you think twice about messing with a, a dwarf jester's um, girlfriend. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, it, it, did did you get the feeling that this was a little bit more cartoony than your normal Edgar Allan Poe story? <laughs> a bit cartoony, a little bit mean spirited, but um, yeah, it's also pretty straightforward. Like it's just yeah. We, this is. And there was a happy ending. The guy got the girl for once. <laughs> you know how how the girl, how the women in Poe stories usually tend to die. So you know. Mhm. Mm yeah, and you notice the orang. Uh, the, the orangutans. How, how the it was gruesome, like the way they were dying. It, but you you don't really feel any sympathy for them. Yeah, and also you sort of feel like that this small revenge was justified. Yeah, and the orangutans. Uh, you, you you remember we talked about that uh, Poe had this weird obsession with orangutans when we uh, did murders mm -hmm. in the Rue Morgue. And oh, he he would have he would have loved that Clint Eastwood movie then every which way by a lo but loose. <laughs> okay. At least I think I think I think it was that yeah. one. The one was an orangutan. Yeah, and I remember this story also very well. I, I read this in high school uh, when it was translated, and I, I actually really like this. Um, there is a bit of a dark backstory to this. Um, like I said, this is one of the very final Poe stories. I don't I'm not, I don't remember if it was um, published during his lifetime or after his death. I'm uh, sorry, it, it did say the publishing date, but I don't actually remember when Poe died. But this was, in fact meant um, to be a bit of a, a, a revenge story uh, in real life and it was directed at some uh, at some American socialites uh, that Poe was not very pleased with they were some uh, it was some lady I forget the, her name but she had said something very some very unflattering things about Poe and she, and he wrote this story specifically as a kind of a diss track to him oh, then, yeah. Yes. 
So he, so he straw man them all. Yeah, that, that, so I had forgotten about this, but then I noticed, like, all the freaking fat jokes that he kept putting in there. And obviously the king and the ministers are supposed to stand in for this lady and her group of friends. So that's what it was about. <laughs> Damn, he could get savage. Yeah, he was savage. So um, that, that's, that's an interesting little tidbit of uh, trivia that people always bring up. I still think, I, I personally like this. It does have a bit of a fairy tale feeling to it because it's just mm -hmm. some king in some kingdom somewhere far away. And Poe did sometimes write those kinds of stories that had kind of a vague setting that you couldn't really tell, you know, where they were supposed to be set. Uh, but this is kind of special because it's it's so uh, you know removed and uh, from anything that resembles, but it, it, even something like a very um, a very very um, uh, abstract story like the Pit and the Pendulum, at least is distinctly like sets itself in a certain geographical location. Even if then what happens in the story is kind of it, it has kind of a loose narrative. Uh, but this uh, this one, I, I I've always liked this one. I think it's kind of funny, funny, and you know it is gruesome, but it's it's kind of darkly comical. It almost has. Do you get the feeling like this? Is, this could make for like a Tim Burton movie. <laughs> I was I was thinking it was a bit more Shakespearean actually. Yeah, no, but in Shakespeare, everybody dies. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, not not a, not everybody. There are some stories where the heroes well, live. Maybe yeah. Well, Tim Burton, but maybe if Tim Burton directed an episode of, like, Tales from the Crypt, yeah, that it, could, it would work well there. Yeah, yeah, that could work, yeah. All right. But I really enjoyed that, and uh, that's been on the to-do list for a long time. That is, ab that is absolutely one of my favorites. Way to go, Elmer. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> All right. But, hey, um, if there's nothing else to add, thank you for listening. This has been the Honda and Kaiser's YouTube podcast number five. And do you have any last words, Kaiser? Yeah, be careful of whose girlfriend you make fun of. Otherwise, you'll find yourself dressed as an orangutan, hanging up in the ceiling, burning to death. Yeah. Also, I didn't point it out again, but actually they, they spell orangutan kind of weirdly in this story. Or, well, I guess this was just the accepted spelling, but it's like two words with a hyphen in the middle. So the first word is orang, and then it's hyphen Gutang or something like that. So yeah, so, so it's always like it seems like it seems such a weird word when that just kind of pops up, but you know it, it you just say orangutan and you know that's that's how how you say it. But anyway, that has been the podcast. Thank you for listening and see you on the next one. Bye bye.